even pre-pandemic, you know, 40% of their time at the desk, the rest of the time they're around having meetings or bumping into people um, and having quick chats. So now people can work from home. Uh, that trust has become that much more important. To flatten all this down into a one-size-fits-all is what really makes people into the meat puppets that Colin, Colin always prefers to. And, you know, even, you know, in terms of expressions, oh, oh yeah, you'll get called in on the carpet. I remember that being an expression, you'll have to go in on the carpet. Because <laughs> you're not going to be able to do a utilisation study of where they are when they're not in the office, unless you're a horrible boss and you're tracking their every move. If you want to attract more people into the office for social occasions, they've got to put on events. So people from a hospitality background could be a recommendation. But our offices are empty for two two days a week. Well, actually, they're already empty for two days a week. It's called a weekend. And undoubtedly, that also means that you have to allow for some iteration, right? How is their philosophy of how they lead, organise and manage going to be reflected in that built environment? People, employees have decided they want flexible working. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So um, bosses, maybe not so. If you don't take care of your talent, you will lose the ability to function in a, in a market that is highly competitive. So you will lose. Welcome to this episode of Work Punks. Today we have another guest and the guest for this episode is Damien Mears of Third Link called Celting. He is a workplace design expert and he is going to share with us his expertise and experience on what that means in a world where hybrid working is of course the new norm. So apart from Damien, we have of course Colin Newlin of the Crepify work and Ben Simpson's Vital Org. Um, so welcome to this episode. We hope that you will enjoy it as usual. Damien, why don't you introduce your very specific and very niche work, I think, and uh, and the experience that you've gained over the years on this. And, and very specifically, how do you see the future of office working in a world where um, essentially hybrid working is going to be the new norm, isn't it? Well, could be, yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my background is in workplace. Uh, I guess in a nutshell, my job is to consult with the client and understand how their business works and how their workplace then needs to function. And that then gets briefed to the architect as to what to design. And then we also can take it on as a change management exercise. So if there's a lot of behavior shift that's required to fulfill that new workplace, we will also get involved in the change management in the lead up to the new workplace so people can hit the ground running, ideally. Um, typically, we do large corporate offices. So you think of the you know, FTSE 100 type level. Um, I've done global projects, regional projects, uh, build toolkits in order to roll these things out across the world, uh, new, new types of workplaces. Um, but more and more, uh, it's getting into... Um, how people are better supported, not just from a tool perspective, but from, a, you know, how people are managed and, and the sorts of things that will make them more productive in the end. Because as we rightly move away from the workplace being the only place you can work, um, we, we're thinking beyond just workplace design, of course. So, yeah, and I think if, if I was to give you a view on the future, um, I think the word is uncertainty. It's very uncertain, normally reflected in the economic uncertainty generally. But I think what we're seeing is that that COVID acceleration of working from home, which in our view as, as consultants for workplace has always been a necessary thing. Now that we have the ability to work anywhere, home should be one of those places. But we've always said it should be one of the places that you can work, not just the only place. So. If I was to advise someone on the future, it should be allowing for flexibility to work anywhere, home being one of them, a workplace where people, your colleagues can all come together, maybe clients as well. So I think that, you know, the future should look in that way. How it will end up, of course, is another another beast entirely and, and one in which um I, I wouldn't like to hang my hat on, to be fair. Can you name some examples of things that uh, that you have uh, introduced, or at least you're you're trying to introduce 
that is very different from say five years ago when you're talking to clients about um, designing the office of the future? For a while, certainly straight after the pandemic, we thought, right, workplaces don't need as many desks. You know, before we used to have a lot of open plan desks and and, uh, a few meeting rooms, and we always argued a more variety of different work settings to support different functions. We would recommend unassigned desking because people spend even pre-pandemic you know 40 percent of their time at the desk the rest of the time they're around having meetings or bumping into people um, and having quick chats so one of the things um, we would always say is let's mix up the places where people can work in an office so things like booths were coming in you know diner booths type things with enclosures where they could work individually or, or have a quick phone call phone booths were getting incredibly popular And just after the pandemic, when people, well, certain clients were saying, well, look, do we need all these office space? Do we need desks? What what is the office now if people are going to be working from home a lot? And as we say to every client, well, let's just investigate you first because there'll be different functions within the organization who have different needs. So some people will be needed in the office more, particularly those who, you know, are on the phone a lot. And need to be talking with their colleagues, particularly sales functions, was one thing where people would benefit from quick chats with each other, support from the manager, that sort of thing. Um, and then there will be a huge range of different ways of working that you'd need to adapt for. And how do you want to meet clients? Is it going to be in an office somewhere in a city centre anymore? Or can you feel comfortable enough to meet them in a cafe in a village where they, they live? So all of those sorts of questions come out of the wash when you investigate a client. And in the end, actually, what we're finding is as people get, I guess, used to hybrid a bit more, they're realizing also that actually coming together more regularly is a benefit. However, you've got to put in place um, an understanding amongst each other, you know, because a lot often this is top down. Well, hybrid has shown the, the importance of listening to the staff and what they need and how they need to perform better particularly i mean people feeling isolated working from home too much there was a well-being became quite an important thing all of these sorts of things need to be analyzed and worked out before you come up with a solution and what i found out certainly with you paul doing your training courses was that having team agreements was something we're starting to recommend more and more so that the team worked together to as almost individualize the requirements so that it benefits the team. But ultimately it's about, okay, we have a target here. We have a business need, which is whatever it is, selling widgets. We need a million widgets sold this year. How are we best going to do that? What suits us as a team in order to make that happen? And where, and then you work out where's the best place to work, where's the best place to meet, where's the best place to get your uh, client meetings done. And you break it down in that sort of way and that's that for me is what we're recommending now. So very bespoke and very uh, much a, a joint effort with the employees who actually will be doing the work and will be in those spaces or not, as the case might be. And as, and their manager as, as well. So mm. so the the managers, have, in my view, have always been important part of any workplace solution because those those people who are who have um, you know staff under them and they have to report up up to others, they are always under the most pressure in an organization, in my view, because particularly in the UK, they're not given the great training to, to be managers. So it does take a while to get to that point, I think, where you can get a team agreement together because that manager needs to accept that that's going to happen. He's not going to fe- feel fearful that they're going to be undermined. And what is their role afterwards? And I like that, that, term coach Paul that you taught me which was you know make sure that they're enablers they're not there to dish out the work they're there to help them get it done I love that subtle difference and in my latest strategies that I've been putting forward to clients I've been advising them to take that sort of route because particularly when trust is a huge issue in managing teams who aren't necessarily in front of you we used to call it presenteeism where managers only felt comfortable when they could see their staff working. Well, how do you know what they're doing unless you're (laughs) sitting next to them and looking at their screen? 
Um, and so now people can work from home. Uh, that trust has become that much more important. And so you've got to take that as a first step. You've got to uh, you turn it psychological safety, which is great. Is that kind of do you feel comfortable amongst your manager to to tell them what your needs are? The manager needs to know their role and be trained into that. So it's not easy. And it's a period of change management that is incredibly important before you even reach to that. What does the workplace really mean for the organization? Yeah, so I think one of the things that I always that always frustrates me is when we talk about these things is we use such general terms in such a uh, confu well, yeah, confusing way. So we talk about work when in fact there are maybe five different types of work that people do from you know the deep focus work to collaboration, networking, and the plain, plain old busy work or crap as I prefer to call it, um, of doing the emails and all that sort of admin bureaucracy stuff. Um, and yet we lump it all together. You know, we talk about meetings and, we, and there's thousands of different types of meetings, you know, from the all day brainstorm where you do need to be together um, and, you know, thrash things out to the the routine um, project meeting, which works, uh, to my mind, actually works much better over things like Zoom because it, it's just it's structured and it you know you want to keep a good pace to it and you don't you don't want people to spend more time getting to the meeting than they spend contributing in the meeting so you know we need to get a lot more clarity um around what we're talking about so i think your point about you know anal analyzing what people are doing or deciding what the solution is whereas in the past it was like we're just going to chuck them all in an office anyway and let them figure it out um but also the other bit i think that is often missed is that there's a there's a cadence to people's work so if you've got the finance department they have a very um they have, they have a calendar you know work, I mean, they're going to be busy at certain they know what they're doing each month and they know what, what, what workload is going to be there pretty much but for other people it's much more variable and if you're working on a project you know there's a time at the beginning you probably do need to be together a lot and then you go away a bit and you work on your own and you come back together and at the end you probably need to be all together again or very highly communicative you know to get it over the line um so that comes into it as well if you if you take a snapshot at the wrong time you're going to build build the wrong solution because you know because if, if everyone's in project initiation you think oh god we need loads of meeting rooms and desks you know Whereas if, if everybody was in the middle, you'd think, well, they can all, they can all work anywhere. Yeah, and that's why we try to steer clients away from mandating anything. I mean, it's always, uh, it fills me with dread when I hear, you know, Microsoft, they're going to mandate two and a half days a week across the world. Well, to your point about the project management team and versus the finance team, that might work for finance, but project managers, you know, they might be off, off-site a lot of that time anyway and that mandating just uh, messes up their productivity if if they start timing you in in the office yeah i, I think a lot of organizations really struggle with this concept of accepting difference right accepting the fact that um ultimately employers are different middle managers are different uh locations are different as you indicated uh, in our little pre-chat uh, whether your organization is based in central london or in 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 remote warwickshire of course that's already a different so there's so many different aspects and for some reason i think organizations love to lump it all together and flatten it to something very something very black and white essentially and very very simple but in those simplification me measures um they disempower everybody that, who's affected by it to flatten all this down into a one size fits all is what really um makes people into the meat puppets that colin colin always refers to um and it takes the the juice out of out of life but also out of out of work i think i was really pleased that colin chipped in with his bit about the different types of work and sometimes we just need to be head down in an environment that allows us to get into flow 
and other times we want to be in a space where it's much more uh social informal uh spontaneous all that i'm also thinking back over my time in kind of corporate life so much of our built environment really served to underpin and reinforce the whole command and control thing you know i went to work for a head office having worked in the regions it was a multi-story building the further you went up the deeper the park it, the carpet got the more comfy the chairs the less of a distance across the car park people had to walk um and you know even you know in terms of expressions oh Oh, yeah, you'll get called in on the carpet. I remember that being an expression. You'll have to go in on the carpet. So a lot of that was about fear as well. So um, so there's this sort of yin and yang, I think, in terms of if you were, as I, I gather a lot of Damien's clients are, so that they say have a blank sheet of paper in terms of we need a new office somewhere. How is their philosophy of how they lead, organize, and manage going to be reflected in that built environment? As well as, very sensibly, picking up on what Colin has said around, well, there's different types of work, and say there are five, well, there's probably only one or one and a half of those types of work that are best done in an office environment. I do take heart from the fact that COVID has done us a, a, a big favor and it has woken us up. Yeah, a client, a client that we went into COVID with, for instance, professional services firm, everybody in rows, straight rows, just you'd take a photo of that and show them a photo of a, a cotton mill or anything else from the Industrial Revolution wouldn't look no different. Uh, and I'm pretty sure if you go to their office now, it's very, very different because they, they, they've recognised that yeah, people don't do the best work at their screens if they're shoulder by shoulder in rows doing that stuff. They need to come to the office for different things. So, Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. They do get influence. And hopefully a client who comes to to me is mindful of that. They're asking the question. And, and you're right. It often is a trigger with a rent review or a relocation. They... They start thinking, okay, is, what do we need from this space? Because if you ask an architect, a lot of them will say, okay, what have you got? And we'll just improve on that. Well, we go deep into the organization. We want to understand, firstly, what the leadership desire, what's their vision for the company. And we want to know, you know, we even show them what they look like to everyone else because often they don't even know what's on their website. So we'll say, Who's, whose strap line is this? We're, we want to be innovative, trusting, <laughs> da, 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 da. and they'll say oh, i don't know microsoft and it's actually theirs you know but you you try to get them to think clearly about what is the vision now what are you trying to achieve are you selling a million widgets in five years if so how do you want to achieve that what's your view from you know everyone every leader in that organization you're talking you know your board of directors ceo head of marketing head of hr you know what do you all think collectively how how do you want to reach this goal are you wanting to be more trusting with your employees? Do you want to be command and control and hierarchy? Where do you see your organization being the most effective on that path? And then we come to them individually and we interview them and we say, okay, at your departmental level, how are you going to translate the, the whole organizational vision and goals and, and achieve on those metrics of success? And then we'll do some other analytics. And we used to do a lot of utilization studies where we'd have somebody walking around the space every hour going, what are these people doing? Where are they? And then come up with these mad graphs to show, well, they're hardly ever at their desk. They're all over the place. You know, they're doing different things. And they became quite sophisticated. But now, of course, that's kind of irrelevant because you're not going to be able to do a utilization study of where they are when they're not in the office unless you're a horrible boss and you're tracking their every move, which I think is illegal in in Europe. Um, but uh, yeah, then you, you'll you do workshops, you'll do questionnaires of the staff. We want to find out, we break that down. We can, I like to do middle manager workshops, focusing on how they need to perform. I'll segment the questionnaires by them. I'd also do age because as you know, we're in a multi-generational workforce now and understanding what young people need versus older people uh, obviously splits it like Paul said. Uh, they're different different needs i mean i also I, I found out something 
it was a bit of a slap in the face. I was like, young people don't need to come into the office. And then uh, I was reminded of, well, how many friends do you actually make from work? I was like, yeah, that's true, actually. And, and you can't make friends just through Zoom. Uh, you have to have social events. You have to hang out with them and you have to go through face to face. I'm a firm believer of that now. And I probably didn't think about it that way before. But those sorts of elements also need to come out. So the softer things. Um, and then you put it all together in a, what we call a workplace strategy, a strategic brief document that goes back to the leadership. You present it, hopefully, to the board again and say, you know, this is what we've found. We've listened to everybody in the organization. We come up with a, quite often profiles. So we're now using an awful lot of um, experiential designs in our, in, our, in our recommendations. So we'll do a day in the life journey map. That's quite useful to sort of illustrate, OK, you know, here's, here's Julia. This is her morning. She has a horrible commute because, you know, we also do address mapping. We'll find out how far people are now living because a lot of people move further away from cities during the pandemic. So, you know, we try to work out, OK, what whether location that could be changed to make it better for everyone. Then we'll go through what their troubles are with technology, what their problems are with getting into the office, how they're welcomed. Uh, how they feel, because as you pointed out, Ben, you know, sitting down at your desk and sitting there working all day, people could be pretty miserable. And 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 it's often, you know, the way the the tools support you, you know, technology in particular. We look at all those tools. We talk to the technology teams and work out, you know, what trouble they're having. Because listening to their issues can also be interesting. Because they might say, well, from a security perspective, this is why we have all these things. And then you talk to the security people, especially in banking, and you try to work out, is there any things we can make things a bit more streamlined and, and easier on the user? And that then, you know, functions into our, um, our recommendations. So it's, it's very multifaceted. It's getting more and more. You're looking at an individual level. It used to be departmental. You know, as I mentioned before, you if you're doing a global client, um, like a big global bank you you persuade them that you cannot do a homogenous one strategy for the whole world that just won't work in certain countries it won't work in certain you know offices in certain cities even so you really do need to individualize these things at that level uh, we sometimes recommend investing in people you know we say well look you've got to retrain your facilities team who are who are managing the office to if you want to attract more people into the office for social occasions, they've got to put on events. So people from hospitality background could be a recommendation or a head of workplace experience as a new role that reports into the board. You know, all of these things can come out in recommendations to help better support them. So is that also to, to tempt people more into the office to make it more appealing to them rather than to be seen as a, um, a, a whip being cracked? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, mandates rarely work. Uh, you'll lose people at, at worst, but mm -hmm. at best, you'll just make people unhappy. So we try to say, look, carrot is better than the stick. And if you want people to come into the workplace, what's it for? Is it networking? Is it knowledge sharing? Is it just social? What is it that's going to make uh, this a more effective use of their time? Because mm -hmm. ultimately, they've got their job to do. So it could be a mixture. And, and what I learned from my time in co-working, I used to have my own co-working space. I used to consult on co-working. I learned a lot from that. That sort of mashup of hospitality focus within your workplace really is something corporates can learn a lot from. Uh, putting on really interesting events, you have some inspirational speakers, kind of like a mini TED talk, um, having, it, having it once a week on a particular day where you think, right, we need to get everyone in the office to collaborate, you know, you look at things like that. I mean, I, I had a challenge the other day. Uh, a client said, we want people in on Fridays. How are we going to get people in on Fridays? How are we going to flatten the curve? Because now Tuesday or Wednesday is the most popular day. Mondays and Fridays, no one's in. Well, one of the recommendations, a lot of the, um, the staff were saying, you know, we need to do more for the community. Some were self-organized. They were actually helping commu local communities without the company getting involved so why not make friday a community day where you invite the community into your workplace and how you do that could be different mechanisms i mean one of them was now there's a great company that does urban farms within offices they have hydroponic really nice systems 
and you have harvest days. So when the cycle of you know lettuce is grown, you can invite schools in from the local community, say, and the team come together, you know, staff come together to help harvest, learn about growing food. And, you know, you create a whole buzz around it. That's something that can really uh, work. One, one of the issues I've become aware of more recently is, is this, um, you know, you talked about hot desking earlier before, I think before we started, and um, that's become, that became very popular by companies, but quite unpopular with staff. So I remember someone who was at the BBC when they opened the new centre, and that was all hot desking. And then suddenly people had um, put all stuff around their hot desk and had the same hot desk every day. And mm. did, and, and it, if, if somebody sat at their hot desk, then they just sat opposite them and stared daggers at them all day, so they didn't do it again. So you have a, you have a tension there between... Um, giving people the flexibility, but also people wanting something that is theirs rather than everything being shared. Um, so, you know, I don't know if there are any ideas to resolve that. And, and I guess my bigger point is a lot of hot desky stuff, and indeed those horrible open plan offices that Ben mentioned earlier, is driven by cost. And it seems to me that there's always been this big cost focus for the last, I don't know, 30 years. You know, it's always about the cost rather than being about the utility. So then you end up with these arguments about, but our offices are empty for two two days a week. Well, actually, they're already empty for two days a week. It's called a weekend. You know, is that a problem if you're still getting what you need done out of the resources? Yeah, uh, whenever whenever I'm hired by the real estate function within an organisation, it tends to be how do we save space? You know, we we're spending all this money on real estate. Um, and that's how hot desking, I mean, hot desking actually wasn't originally like that. It was more about, um, uh, moving around. It was, it was for people who didn't need to be in the same desk every day. And then it, it was suddenly leaked upon as a way of saving money. Um, and of course they kept the open plan. So, um, it wasn't really satisfying for anyone that the fact that people decorated their desk was almost, we, we found was a sign that of of needing to decorate <laughs> because the soullessness of the office meant you wanted to bring a bit of personality to it. So um, if you took that away, you took away almost their feeling that they belonged there. It, it, if we mixed up the space, it, we never recommended hot desking on its own. It was always, you have to provide a variety of other supportive spaces that are going to be tr more attractive than a desk. What it was, really about is okay we've got to redesign the whole thing and the behaviors of how you operate within the workplace and offer work from home so that's why you know hot desking we found always should have been complemented with working from home as well and it's just about the freedom to work during the day where you best fit with the team performance in mind mm. and that's how uh hybrid also should work i mean we mentioned earlier it's 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 you can have any initiative, but if it's not working because you haven't set it up right with the right tools, the right behaviors, the right operational uh, design and workplace design or home design, it's, it's, it's not going to function and everyone can say it doesn't work. And undoubtedly, that also means that you have to allow for some iteration, right? Because we're all finding our way through this new world of, of flexible working anyway. But even in any team, you know, things change and you'll find out what works and what doesn't work. And maybe over a period of time, you come to the conclusion that uh, you need some more space together or some more time together uh, at some point um, and need some space for that. Well, absolutely. So, uh, presumably the office therefore needs to be much more flexible in order to, to respond to that. I mean, always I say in the strategies, why wait till the next lease renewal or, or end before you change the workplace because you might have 10 years i mean okay mm. long leases aren't so common now but they are still there mm. and therefore a lot of the solutions certainly from a design perspective is to build in flexibility yeah. in the work settings um and it helps as well the sustainability accreditation is so tough now on fixed rooms so building a fixed room uh embodied carbon scores are too high so you want to reduce that and there's a lot of great solutions now for rooms that can be moved over a weekend. They're sort of cube-like glass structures that you can plumb in air conditioning in the top um, and power 
and then if you want to move them, you can. Um, so we're now looking at, uh, I guess, 90 percent of the floor space is not fixed. And that's so important because you can't predict the future. You can't. And therefore, and also we've always said flexible working is about being flexible to change. There was one client in Australia I did, uh, New Zealand, sorry, uh, that we built everything on wheels as, a, as an experiment in a pilot project where all the settings every day they could they could move them around if they wanted. I mean, it turns out they didn't move them a great deal. I mean, that's human nature, isn't it? Uh, but we weren't expecting that in a way. It was almost like, well, next year when you're looking again at your business plan and what you have to produce for that year, you might look again and how do we interpret that in how we need to work? So therefore you might move things around every year, I would say at most. Yeah, there, and there is a well-known self-managing uh, game development company called Valve that actually famously gave everybody desks on wheels so that if they felt they were no longer in the right project, they were totally empowered to roll their desk and their chair to another project that they felt they were better uh, contributing more or better able to to uh, to create value. So the debate around whether flexible working is here to stay and whether working from home delivers the benefits that uh, uh, also for organizations um, that were, were muted earlier in the, in the pandemic, uh, whether those benefits are, are really there and are here to stay. I mean, that debate is, is still raging, isn't it? And, and, uh, and there are plenty of examples of large organizations that have tried to uh, coerce their, their employees back to, to head office. What do we think? Where is it heading? Is flexible working here to stay? Will head, headquarter offices be a thing of the past in 10 years time or or, or will we be back in, into a much more conventional world in 10 years? Ben, what do you think? I think that is the, the, the area of the future of work that I, that I, uh, I and least comfortable <laughs> making any prediction about um but but what i what i do know and what i do hope for is that organizations do that momentum builds around the you know high trust high autonomy low bureaucracy human centered kind of organization and i think that momentum started and i think it's 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 inevitable that as the new entrants to um, the world of work um, are attracted to work for those organisations and not the old school command and control type organisations, then I think that will really build build that momentum over time. Mm -hmm. um, so if my wish comes true and that <laughs> happens, then I think the nature of the office will change. I don't think it's more office or less office, but I think you'll go to the office for very, very different reasons. I, th I think I think the, the question has been answered, but it depends who you ask as to what the answer you get at the moment. So mm. people, employees have decided they want flexible working. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So um, bosses, maybe not so. And certainly people who own you know, large buildings definitely don't want <laughs> flexible working. Um, so it's just a question of, you know, like how quickly companies move there and where they exactly end up. Um, and I think in some industries, in some for some companies, you know, it all makes sense to keep a head office. Um, certain structures will, you know, suit um, the, the way they organize themselves and operate, uh, which will be, you know, viable in their industry that might not be viable in another industry, say. But I think there's just such massive benefits to becoming really uh, flexible. Uh, and we haven't even really begun to uncover them. So we, we can talk about, you know, making real estate savings and all that sort of stuff. Um, the guy who was on Shark Tank in the US, who's got about 50 businesses involved in, was talking about the free cash flow that, that they've suddenly got from going remote. Um, so those are big benefits. But I think... You know, all the stuff you talked about, Damien, about, you know, the, the way of working the structures and the the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure you put in place has so many upsides for productivity. I just think that companies that embrace it are going to outperform those who sit in their head office, you know, putting their head in the sand and saying, no, no, we want everybody in four days a week. And 
So uh, I, it's just a matter of time, really. And it's going to be interesting to watch. And as I said before, I think one or two big companies will will disappear. Yeah, I, I I would agree with both of you. And and I mean, you are already seeing Canary Wharf and other big corporate centres uh, empty out. You know, HSBC uh, vacating masses, and they're probably going to go back to the city, get a smaller, more of a showcase office because Canary Wharf for them was more of a sort of middle or back office at the beginning um and now you know even at large scale towers in new york are, are, are emptying out as well and they're struggling so i think that's that's already the first step is financially they're seeing a reduction as being a huge benefit to the business the smart ones will look at it with the people aspect as well um and bring that together because they would have seen if they'd have done any surveys how important home working is as a component for happiness and productivity and work-life balance um and we see it we saw it before you know if you don't take care of your talent you will lose the ability to function in a in a market that is highly competitive so you will lose the true effect of the pandemic and home working is is really being will be truly felt i think in the next couple of years because what we've had from we've had the pandemic as the experiment we've had that sort of they, what was it the the silent leaving or whatever so what was it resignation um and then the, the flip side of that was uh okay well now we're in a uh a position of economic collapse we we can actually have the power back from employees they all need a job um so you know i think the next couple of years is going to be really where it will all be revealed mm. yeah well the labor market of course is still hugely tight um so in that sense as, as uh as most of you already touched upon, uh, employees still have a very strong power and will vote with their feet um, for which organisations they want to work. And as those organisations that are stuck in the in the twenty tens uh, that will lose at, um, and other organisations that are moving with the times will undoubtedly be the the ones that emerge as winners. But I've I've been fascinated by how you've brought the 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 technical and physical aspects of of office design together with the the human aspect of of how organizations work or can work um so it's been great to have you as our guest damien thank you for joining us um i've learned a lot uh hopefully your you viewers have learned a lot as well if you have any questions or follow-up comments uh, please uh, put them in the in the usual places and uh, we'd love to see you at our at our next episode of Work Punks, that may well be without a guest, we don't know yet. So uh, stay tuned in to, uh, to our social media and we'll keep you up to date on, um, on future episodes. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.